He's a man of mystery. An interpreter of dreams. He was thrown in the lion's den. All upon your name, o The three Hebrew boys. Oh, save me! Why did they not burn? The finger writing on the wall. A book written between the 6th and the 7th century BC is the apocalyptic book of the Old Testament. Join the Reverend Dr. Dylan Toussaint Wednesday nights at 7.30 for The Daniel Story. A book written by Daniel himself. The Daniel Story, Wednesday nights at 7.30. Welcome again to the online Bible study series of the Edgewater Waterford Circuit of Baptist Churches. And a special welcome to those viewing from overseas. Thanks to those who have been sending their questions and comments via the email address I will again be announcing at the end of this broadcast. May our study tonight be insightful and meaningful. But before we go any further, let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for granting us another privilege to study your word. May we be doers as well as hearers of your word as we live our lives to your honor and glory. Amen. Now, last week, we focused on Daniel chapter 6, verse 16 through to verse 23. And we did so under the sub-theme, Daniel in the lion's den. In so doing, we noted four main segments in the story. One, we noted and noticed a frustrating situation. A frustrating situation. King Darius was frustrated because he felt powerless and hopeless. As a result, he had no supper that evening. He had no sleep and he entertained no sounds. Secondly, we noted last week a faith declaration. This declaration was made by Darius. He said to Daniel, your God whom you serve continually will deliver you. He made it because what he observed in terms of Daniel was his faithfulness and his commitment to God. And so he declared it in spite of the fact that he, Darius, was not a worshiper of God. Thirdly, we noticed last week a feeble question, a question coming from King Darius in the wee hours of the morning when he returned to the den. And he asked Daniel, is your God able to deliver you? Quite the opposite from the faith declaration he had made earlier. And then finally, we noticed last week a firm affirmation coming from Daniel, an affirmation of God's faithfulness to him, an affirmation of his innocence before Darius. And so in a nutshell, that was what we uh, noticed and noted as we continued to explore this intriguing and interesting chapter. And tonight, we're going to be looking at verses 24 to 28 of this chapter. Indeed, we are ending this chapter tonight. Chapter 6, verse 24 to 28. And I read from the King James Version. And the king commanded, 
And they brought those men which had accused Daniel. And they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives. And the lions had the mastery of them and break all their bones in pieces. However, they came at the bottom of the den. Then King Darius wrote unto all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever. And his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be even unto the end. He delivereth and rescueth. And he worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in earth, who hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Last week, as you remember, we focused on Daniel in the lion's den. Well, tonight, we're going to be looking on death, death in the lion's den. Now, the story of Daniel in the lion's den does not simply end with his deliverance from the den. Indeed, many persons when they read chapter 6, that's where they end. He was delivered and then that's it. They move on somewhere else in the book of Daniel. But tonight I want us to note that the chapter sadly ends and the story sadly ends with death taking place in that same den. That is the death of Daniel's foes, and Daniel's false accusers. Now, along with this, the following are also evident in the closing verses of chapter 6. And I'd like to share with you then three main points tonight of observations made in regards to this closing segment of chapter 6. Number one, want us to take note of what I want to call an extreme deed. An extreme deed found in verse 24 of the passage. I'm going to read it for us again for emphasis. And the king commanded, and they brought those men which had accused Daniel. They cast them into the den of lions, them their children, and their wives. And the lions had the mastery of them and break all their bones in pieces or ever they came at the bottom of the den. Now, the fact that the wives and the children of Daniel's accusers were also ordered by Daniel or Darius to be cast into the lion's den shows how extreme his action was that day. Indeed, I want to say that such an extreme deed was both cruel and callous in my view. Darius didn't have to respond that way. He didn't have to be so extreme in his response, his reaction to what had transpired. It was an extreme deed of cruelty and callousness. It included the wives of the men and the children of these men. Cruel indeed, unnecessary in my view, extreme, but this was what transpired. 
However, it is likely that Darius responded that way because of two main things. First of all, and evidently, he was very angry with them for what they had done. What we are seeing here is an extremely angry king. He was irate. He was totally beyond himself with anger. And it is against that background that quite likely he co committed and commanded that they be thrown into the lion's den. Not only the men, not only the accusers, but also their wives and their children. He was very angry. But also, when you read the background of the time in the Old Testament, it is likely that he responded that way, not only because he was very angry with them for what they had done, but watch this. It is possible that he felt the need to annihilate their entire families. He felt that he didn't want any other family members to be around again. Totally wipe them off the map. Totally get rid of them. Because he didn't want what they did to actually be done again by any other family member. Indeed, those of you who know the Old Testament well will know that this was the thinking of the time. This was how persons dealt with things that took place that they regarded with such abhorrence that they felt not only the individual who committed the sin, but the entire household, the entire family. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God that we are in the New Testament age and era because it would be a similar thinking. In fact, I dare say that there are persons who still have that concept. Don't we know that? When we hear of some of the activities of gangs and gangsters, it's the same type of a mentality and a thought process to annihilate the entire family. And that was what King Darius did by the command that he gave to his foot soldiers to throw the entire family or families into the den of lions. So that's our first observation tonight out of this story. An extreme deed. But next... I'd like for us to note tonight what I want to call an extraordinary decree. Yes, an extraordinary decree found in verse 25 and verse 26 of our passage. I read them again for us. Verse 25 says, Then King Darius wrote unto all the people, nations and languages that dwell in all the earth. And what he said, peace be multiplied unto you. That's his opening greeting to them, one of peace. But he goes on to say in verse 26, I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men should tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. Why? For he, the God of Daniel, is the living God, steadfast forever, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be even unto the end. Watch those words, everybody. He's saying, I, Darius, make this decree. Sounds familiar? 
sounds familiar that we are seeing and hearing in these texts so far a number of decrees being made now he is giving this extraordinary decree every dominion of my kingdom men should tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God. Wow. Now, I'd like to suggest tonight that this decree was extraordinary in terms of the following. One, it was extraordinary in regards to the message itself. The message. Now, Let's do a little background history. In chapter 3, verse 28 to verse 29, you'll remember that Nebuchadnezzar, remember him? Remember him, king of Babylon? He made a similar decree, but it was not the same. Similar, but not the same. Indeed, Nebuchadnezzar's decree actually prohibited anyone from saying anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember those three guys? When they went into the fiery furnace and after God delivered them with the fourth man in the fire, Nebuchadnezzar made this decree in verse 28 and 29 of chapter 3. And it basically it was saying that nobody in the kingdom of Babylon should say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If they did, they would be in trouble with him and the law. So even if they wanted to criticize, even if they wanted to mock, even if they wanted to jeer the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they had to keep quiet. That was basically the decree that Nebuchadnezzar made. But when you read Darius's decree, it is obvious that Darius went further than that. Why? Because Darius actually commanded the people of the kingdom to watch this, literally fear the God of Daniel. Fear the God of Daniel. Can you imagine that? Nebuchadnezzar was saying, don't say anything against the God of Daniel, of, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Darius is now saying, you are to fear the God of Daniel. Put another way, he is imploring them to engage in awe and worship and a great appreciation for the God of Daniel. He is carrying this thing further than Nebuchadnezzar had. This was an extraordinary decree. And it was extraordinary, as we said a while ago, in regards to the message that was given. But I'd like to also suggest that this decree was extraordinary, not only because of the message, but the messenger. And the messenger was really King Darius. Now here is the extraordinary thing. Darius was not only a Persian king. He was essentially a heathen king. Darius had nothing in essence to do with the God of Daniel. This was a heathen man and king. He did not believe and worship the true and living God. But now in this text, watch this, he refers to the God of the Jews as the living God, steadfast forever, his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed, his kingdom shall be unto the end. Isn't that amazing that this heathen king is referring to the God of the Jews, the God of Daniel, in such a manner. So, what we are seeing in this, these closing verses of this chapter 6, not only an extreme deed 
on the part of King Darius, but an extraordinary decree coming from King Darius. I'd like to suggest that there is a third major observation that we can make in these closing verses. And the third one is this. We see an emphatic distinction, an emphatic distinction found in the final verse of our text, verse 28. It reads, So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius, and in the reign of Cyprus, or Cyrus, the Persian. Daniel, this Daniel, prospered in the reign of Darius, and in the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. Now, I want you to note an interesting phrase, which we find repeated in other sections of chapter 6. It is the phrase or the words, this Daniel, this Daniel, this Daniel. Indeed, beloved, that phrase, those words are also mentioned in verse 3 and verse 5 of this chapter. And I would like to suggest that they are mentioned as a means of distinguishing him from any other person who may have had a similar name at the time. They wanted the reader, they wanted those of us who were reading to know that this wasn't another Daniel. Daniel would have been a Jewish name, but they are saying that there's no, no, none other. This Daniel, this Daniel, this individual known as Daniel that we are talking about is the same Daniel who was exiled in Babylon. The same Daniel who was brought all the way from Judah with the Jews. This same Daniel who was a stranger in this land. This same Daniel who was a servant of the Most High God, this same Daniel is who we are referring to. It's an emphatic distinction that we need to highlight. And speaking about highlight, verse 28 actually highlights the fact that this Daniel prospered. This Daniel prospered. With all that he went through, thrown into the light. This Daniel prospered. This Daniel, who was brought miles away from his homeland to this Babylonish culture and the country, this Daniel prospered. This Daniel, who was persecuted, prospered. This Daniel who was thrown into the lion's den, prospered. And I want us to, to look at this because I, I believe that the writer here didn't just write this for writing's sake. I'd like to suggest that the writer wanted to, 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 to show or to prove something to his readers. And I suggest two things. One, prosperity is not a bad thing nor is it a sin. I repeat, prosperity is not a bad thing, nor is it a sin. And you know, sometimes the way some people talk about this whole matter of prosperity, they make it seem such a bad thing or a sin. And perhaps one could understand because of some of the teaching and preaching that we hear from time to time in regards to prosperity, that gives it a bad name because of how it is slanted and presented. But when you read scripture, it's not a bad thing. It's not a sin. It is what we do with it. We can't read Psalm 1, for example, and not realize that 
prosperity is not a bad thing nor a sin. We can't read 3 John and not realize that prosperity is not a bad thing nor is it a sin. But what we do with it, should it come our way, makes the profound difference. The next thing I'd like for us to note is that prosperity does not make persons immune to suffering. Now, now it's talking about this Daniel. And, and, and this Daniel prospered, it says. But you and I know it didn't make him immune to suffering. He was cast into the lion's den. He was lied upon, falsely accused. This Daniel went through some trying times in terms of his faith. This Daniel faced opposition. This Daniel had the persons who were hell-bent on destroying him at all costs. This Daniel had his fair share of adversity. But the scripture still said that he prospered. So prosperity does not make persons immune to suffering. You can be as prosperous as God wants you to be and still face persecution, suffering, hardships, and antagonism. And so tonight, as we have been doing over the past couple of weeks and months, I want to leave with us tonight what I call some takeaways from this text. Takeaway number one, be careful how we plan and plot for the demise of others. It may result in our own demise. And, and I, I, I say we I, because I want to warn all of us. Sometimes we focus on what others have done or are doing when we read texts such as these. But we also need to self-examine. And so what is the first takeaway is that we have to be careful. Careful, everybody, careful how we plan and plot for the demise of others. Somebody once said, if you dig a pit for others, dig one for yourself. Be careful because what goes around comes around what we sow. We shall reap. We might be plotting and planning our own demise. Next. God is so sovereign that he can use an ungodly messenger to declare a godly message. He certainly used Darius. Eh? He certainly did. That, that God used Darius, this ungodly messenger, to declare a godly message. And finally, prosperity provides no guarantee against adversity. Prosperity provides no guarantee against adversity. Sometimes when we hear people talk about prosperity and being prosperous, they give the impression that everything is hunky-dory. No problems, no pain, no suffering, no hardships, no persecution, no adversity. When you read scripture, and especially this text, we realize that that is simply untrue. I'd like to leave with us some questions for us to consider. Questions to consider. Now, I have three questions. Again, I'd like to leave with us to ponder over the next couple of days. Question number one. How extreme am I? in my thoughts and actions, especially when I get angry. I've been looking on Darius. What about us as individuals? How extreme are we in our thoughts and our actions? And maybe even our words. Do we say, do, think things that are extreme? 
because of the nature of our anger. Secondly, how open am I to the possibility that God can use an ungodly messenger to speak a godly message? There's some people who have closed off their minds and their ears to that possibility. When you read scripture, you don't see that. Certainly not in this text. What we are seeing is this Darius, an ungodly man in many ways. God used him to declare a godly message. And then thirdly, what have been my views on prosperity over the years and why? We all need to ask that question. What, what have we been thinking? What have been our opinions? What, what, what has been our point of view in regard to prosperity? Is it negative or positive? Is it that we are ambivalent? What has been our view and why has that been so? I hope that those three questions and three takeaways from our passage tonight will be something that we can spiritually chew on and benefit from. Before I close in prayer, I want to remind you that you may send your questions and or comments to the following email address, the Daniel story. 2020 at gmail.com. I repeat, the Daniel story 2020 at gmail.com. Continue to send your questions and comments. Interesting questions and comments have been sent so far. Looking forward to those that are to come. And for those who feel led, Please do so in short order. I promise to respond quickly. And so, let us pray. Lord, tonight again, we are truly honored to have been given this opportunity to examine and re-examine your word. We thank you for the nuggets of truth that you have brought to the fore of our consciousness tonight. We thank you, God, that you have reminded us in so many ways of how extreme our thoughts, our actions, our words can be when we become angry. I pray for those who have a temper problem that they have been grappling with for years. I pray, God, that you give them self-control, which is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. I also pray, God, that you enable us to understand that you are so awesome, that you can use anyone or anything, anywhere, anyhow, to your glory, because you are sovereign. Help us to be able, oh God, to acknowledge this, to be aware of this, and to celebrate your power in that regard. And finally tonight, God, we just pray that you enable us as we seek to understand more of how you work in our lives, to know that God, even though you may be working and prospering your people, it does not make us immune to suffering, immune to persecution, and immune to adversity. Help us in spite of these things to remain strong, resolute in our commitment and our faithfulness to you. So thank you once again for hearing our prayer. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us. We hope you will join us again as we worship together. Please remember to pray for each other. 
there is power in prayer. Have a blessed week in the Lord.